Hey everybody, today's service is starting in one minute, and today we're kicking off the new year with a new series titled The Gospels, with today's teaching titled The First Gospel. So let's find our seats, turn our phones on silent, and let's get ready to worship our Lord. everybody and happy new year i'm so excited to join you once again in another year thanks for joining us and for spending some of your time with us today if you are joining us for the first time we want to welcome you thanks for joining us i want to encourage you to please fill out one of those connect cards which you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you and if you've chosen to join us online this morning welcome we're excited you're here Please comment or hit that like button to let us know that you're joining us this morning. For tithes and offerings, you can send an e-transfer to vpcctreasurer at outlook.com, or you can place them in the boxes located here in the sanctuary. It's a new year, and I'm excited to get things started, to kick things off. It's going to be an amazing year of 2024. I do want to first just encourage you guys to check out small groups. We have a bunch of small groups that meet monthly or even weekly here at Vantage Point. The ways that you guys can check these out is, first of all, you can join us on Facebook. We have a VPCC small groups groups that you can check out. And there you have a list of all of our small groups and how periodically they meet, as well as the leader that meets with them. So you can definitely check out there. If you're joining us in person, I want to encourage you to check out our bulletin. Bulletin, we try to keep up to date with all the small groups that are happening, so you can definitely check that out. Also, in the front foyer, we do have a bulletin board that has upcoming events, as well as the calendar for two months. So you have January and February out in the front foyer. Check that out. It has the small groups and when they're meeting. So there's definitely ways for you guys can check this out. Lastly, guys, talk to Tanya Fedora. She can also direct you in the right direction. But I do want to encourage you to please be checking out our events, checking out our small groups, and be a part of our community this year. Happening next Friday is going to be a family movie night happening right here at the church. Again, it's a family movie night, so you can bring your kids. It is family friendly. Come on out and enjoy just a time of watching a movie and fellowship. So it's going to be happening here at the church next Friday at 7 p.m. And everyone is welcome. I also just wanted to let you guys know that in the month of January, we are going to be doing a bottle drive in support of Party at the Point. Party at the Point is only eight months away. And I know eight months seems like it's a long time, but it's going to come really quickly. And yes, we're fundraising once again to be able to put on this free community event for our community, for our church, and we're excited to do so. So if you've got bottles, you can start to bring them into the church and I will take them in. If you're unable to bring them in, please come talk to me and I will arrange a time to come pick them up from you. And thank you so much for supporting this event. We're excited and cannot wait. Once again, guys, for all other events, for our small group information, I do want to encourage you, follow us on Facebook and check out our website, which is vantagepointcc.org. And if you're in person, get yourself a bulletin. Now, let's get this service started. Good morning. It's good to see you here. Why don't you stand with us? We'll start with some worship. You begin, you will sustain 
Come on. 
confession, Lord, that we are weak, so very weak, but you are strong. thousand generations falling down to worship to sing the song of ages to the land and all who've gone before us and all who will believe to sing the song of ages to the land Your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all although and dominions are vast and positions your name
I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind And I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Soil captive by depression. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Bring every stronghold, shine through the shadow. Jesus in the street, Jesus in the darkness, over every enemy, Jesus for my family, speak the holy name, Jesus. Starting off talking about the gospel BC, before Christ, is there any kind of mention of the gospel in the Old Testament? But before we get there, got a couple kids here, got, got a few that are a little too young to answer my questions, but the older ones will, you know. You want him to answer all your, all your questions? Here they are. Where did God place Adam and Eve? That should be a fairly easy one. You know, start you off, off 
slow in 2024? Where did God place Adam and Eve? Who did God curse first in the Garden of Eden? Okay. I, I'm hearing some answers. I'm not saying that they're right, so I wouldn't, you know, you can listen or you, or you not listen. It's kind of like phone a friend. You can phone them. Whether they'll give you the right answer, I don't know. And what does proto-evangelion mean? That's probably the hardest of them. What does proto-evangelion mean? Okay? Yep, okay, you got it. Okay, good. So, there is a bit of a, how can I put this? There is a bit of a procedure that goes through, often with celebrations. So I, I took a couple pictures of some celebrations. There's one. It's a fairly familiar picture. You can see Winston Churchill. Uh, he's got, a little harder to see maybe, but if you look closely, he's got that cigar still hanging out of his mouth, as he always did. And uh, he's got his two fingers up. And for all you young people, he was not saying peace. Long before two fingers meant peace, it meant victory. So he has got his two fingers up, and he's indicating victory. His picture is taken from Whitehall. Uh, he's got a couple of cronies with him, but you can just see the mass of crowds that are, that are below him. Um, so there's one picture. Same day as that picture was taken, another picture was taken in the colonies. You know, Britain has colonies. This one was taken in the colonies. This, in, in this case, the colony was called Canada. Maybe you know where that is. Um, it was actually taken in Toronto. Same sort of thing. There's a celebration going on. Um, notice the flag. Again, for those who are younger, uh, the maple leaf did not become our flag until 1965. Before that, we had the Union Jack. That's what's hanging up there. Um, is a Union Jack. So obviously this picture is taken before 1965. Um, little history lesson if you want one. Before the Union Jack, it was, I believe, the cross of St. George that was our flag. And before that, it was the French flag. So we kind of went through a little string of flags before we finally got our, our maple leaf going. Sure. I'll, 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 I'll defer to you on that one. But there's a celebration going on. The date for both of these pictures is May 8th, 1945. It's not a date, at least in my circles, that we remember a whole lot about. May 8th, 1945. If I asked you when the First World War ended, you could probably tell me quite quickly it was on November 11th because we celebrate that every year. May 8th, 1945, was actually the day that the war in Europe ended. Second World War was not over yet. Japan was still fighting. But in Europe, it had ended. And so um, Adolf Hitler had committed suicide about a week before that. Again, this is before internet and a whole bunch of other things that told us quite quickly what was going on. Uh, took time for for the news to get filtered out there, but on May 8th, it came quite quickly that the fighting in Europe was done. Germany had signed a declaration of surrender, and the, they were leadership, leaderless, and at least some of the soldiers would be coming home. Here's the, the process. Celebrations, not always, but often follow tragedy. We wouldn't have a May 8th celebration like we saw with uh, Winston Churchill or with this picture taken in, in Canada, except that there was a tragedy called World War II, which killed a lot of people, and we were anxiously waiting for it to be over. So when the news came that the war and the, the, the fighting in, in Europe 
had finished, people spontaneously poured out into the streets to celebrate the end of the war in Europe. Like I said, it would be September of that year before Japan would, 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 would surrender. But, but the war in Europe was done. Hitler was no longer the menace that we had seen him to be. And so there was a celebration. Sometimes we, during the, that year uh, between the death of, of Queen Elizabeth and the coronation of King Charles, a lot of people question why such a long time between the time when the former sovereign died and the new sovereign officially takes over. And that's actually a bad question because King Charles took over on September 8th. 2022. He was king as soon as Elizabeth passed away. But that's the problem. Elizabeth passed away. And nobody was in a mood to celebrate a new king when we had just lost a queen who meant a lot to a lot of us. As much as the monarchy has its faults and, and problems, we probably saw Elizabeth walk through that minefield better than, than a lot of people have. And we weren't sure what Charles was going to bring us. Again, we have a celebration that follows on the back of tragedy. The tragedy was the death of the queen, and Charles needed time to deal with that. It's one of the only jobs that, you know, to get the job, you have to wait till the one in front of you dies. And then once he had finished mourning and the country had mourned a little bit, then we had a coronation on May 6, 2023. But it was a time of tragedy and triumph. There are a lot of things that follow that pattern. As much as we hate the lows... We wouldn't have the celebrations if it wasn't for them. If it wasn't for that moment when everything is so bad, there wouldn't be the heights of celebration that we have when we finally get through that time. This morning, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3, and Genesis chapter 3 is the beginning of a tragedy. In fact, the first... 12 verses, 13 verses, are all about the tragedy that happened in the garden. It was a time when, yes, Adam failed. Eve failed. The serpent failed. I had a conversation with a friend, and it's, it's around this whole idea about whether or not God knows everything. And I struggle with that. I, I struggle with that because if God knew that Adam and Eve were going to fail, and that failure was going to cause pain throughout the world, why would he bother? If he knew what was going to happen, if he knew the people that were, that were going to die and world wars and even smaller wars. Why would he bother with the whole experiment? Why would he put us through that kind of pain? And that's just, that's something that I struggle with, but maybe you don't. That's okay. The Garden of Eden was a great place for Adam and Eve, and that's where God placed them in the very beginning. He put them in the Garden of Eden, and he said, listen, you can you, you can enjoy the garden. It was a massive garden. You can go anywhere you want. I've only got one rule. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, leave that one alone. Anything else you want to do, go ahead. Go do it. There's, there's lots of trees. There's lots of fruit. There's lots of food. Just go out and enjoy yourselves. Just keep away from that one tree. And I, I said before that, you know, if it was me, maybe I'd kind of, you know, 
go to another part of the garden where that tree wasn't, and I won't be tempted, right? I'll just go and I'll, I'll, I'll live over there among that group of fruit trees and whatever else. I can find what I need to do over there. But apparently Adam and Eve didn't do that. They, they hung around the tree. And for a while, they kept their hands off of it. But then the surf, serpent came and said, Listen, why don't you eat off of that tree? And Eve exaggerated a little bit. She said, No, no, God told us that if we eat off that, if we even touch the fruit on that tree, we will die. Now, there's nothing about touching the fruit. It was eating the fruit, but, you know, that's okay. Maybe that helped her. And so the serpent says to Eve, listen, I can tell you, if you eat off of that tree, you're not going to die. You're going to become like God with the knowledge of of good and evil. And that sounded good for some reason to Eve, and so she went over and ate off the tree. And then she went to Adam and said, hey, you've got to come and taste some of this fruit. It's really good. It's really good. You really need to. And Adam went, because men do whatever women say. And so she went to the, he went to the tree and had some, and, and, and they understood from a very experiential way what good and evil was because they had both done wrong. They had come and they had eaten off the tree. They had had failed in the only rule that they had. They only had one rule. And they couldn't even keep that. No wonder we struggle. I was listening to Tim Keller this week, an old sermon of his somebody sent me. And he got talking about Lady Diana and... Mother Teresa. And I remember the time. I I remember the moment when Princess Diana, Lady Diana, passed away in that car accident in Paris. I remember watching the news and having it come on that Teresa, or sorry, that Diana had died. It was a, it was a great moment We've got somebody who's wandering here. It's okay. But a few days later, Mother Teresa died. And the argument that was there between these, these, there was two groups actually arguing about it, about why it was that for some reason, Diana got all the press while Teresa didn't seem to get as much. Yeah. You think you can get up here alone? I think you might need my help, bud. Diana seemed to get a lot of the press while Teresa was buried. And so groups started to, to argue about why that was. And they actually came up with the same solution, the same reason why, but how they interpreted it was different. The solution was, well, we live in a culture of popularity, and Diana was more popular than Teresa. She had more celebrity, and therefore the news followed after Diana instead of Teresa. And those on the side of Teresa said, well, that's not the way it should be. Teresa changed our culture. She, she, she ministered to the poorest of the poor. She made changes in how we deal with poor people. She made a sacrifice of her life to, to do this. Diana was rich and privileged, And, yes, she made some differences, but not like Teresa did. And the other side was, yes, but 
you know, Teresa was, Teresa had some faults, oh, sorry, Diana had some faults, Teresa had some faults too, but Diana had some faults, but, but she was more human. And she was easier to follow. We, we wanted to be more like, like Diana than we wanted to be like Teresa. We wanted to wear the clothes that Diana, we wanted to run in the circles that Diana ran in. We, we wanted to be more like that. We didn't want to go to India and minister among the poorest of the poor and sacrifice our life. That's just not who we are. We don't want to do that. We, we enjoy the, the foibles of Diana over the virtue of Teresa. And if that's true, then we should really love the story of the Garden of Eden because that's what it's all about. Our four parents who were imperfect and got themselves kicked out of the garden because they couldn't keep one rule. And we know that. We, we, we understand that because we've been there ourselves. So we're going to read, I'm just going to read a couple verses this morning, and they come from Genesis chapter 3, and they follow this story. We could actually cut Genesis 3 in, in, into two parts. The first part describes the fall, and the second part is kind of the outflow of it. But here's what we're going to read, just a couple verses from the outflow, from the second part. And, it's, and it starts off like this in verse 14. So, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, that's it. That's, <laughs> we're going to stop right there. Because you have done this. And if you want to fill in that blank, it's we live with consequences. Because you have done this. We live with the consequences of our actions. We just do. And most of you probably realize that. We have suffered through consequences. I'm watching it. We, there, there is consequences to what we do. Our actions produce consequences. If I had a message, especially to younger people right now, here's the message. Figure things out now. Because you don't want to get old like me and have to live with the consequences of what you did wrong. That's just it. The older you get, the more consequences. And if we can somehow keep those consequences down, life will be easier. But we all live with consequences. So I talked a little bit about, about finances last week, and somebody said, how are you doing? Well, the same rule applies. Start working on your finances when you are young, and you will have money when you are old. But the longer you wait, you will have the consequences of that waiting when you get old like me. And the whole thing is, starting early helps. But when we're young, we don't think we need to do that. And so we spend all of the money that we have because we think we've got many years to save up for retirement. And somehow, you'll find this out, life goes fast. And sometimes when you thought you had lots of time, you find out you've run out of time. And you've got problems. And God never said that he would get rid of our consequences. He said he would get rid of our sin. We would be holy before him and able to enter heaven with him because he had taken care of the sin. And sometimes I think he does take care of some of our consequences, but often he leaves the consequences in place to remind us of what we have done and why that was not a smart move. So we can tell the next generation, don't do it like me. Do something different. And as far as the Bible is concerned, the best 
illustration of this that I can think of is King David. King David was a man after God's own heart. It says that in the Bible. God loved David. But David did some really stupid things for which he had to pay the consequences for. And one of them happened, and I'll just say this, in the spring when most of the kings go out to war. Israel sent their armies out to war, but King David decided he was going to take that spring off and he was going to stay at home. And so while all the fighting men are out fighting wars, David's back in Jerusalem and he goes up on the top of his palace which is higher than anybody others, anybody else's house. And he starts wandering around the top of his palace, and he sees a beautiful woman taking a bath. And if you're wondering why the person was taking a bath on the roof, there's a simple answer for that too. Ladies, if you want a hot bath, you take the bathtub up to the roof, you put water in it, you let the sun heat it up. And when evening comes, you can have at least a warm bath. This is what this woman had done. David falls in love with her, sends for her. I won't go into all the details. You know all the details of what happened, so I don't have to do that. Bathsheba gets pregnant. And David realizes he's got a problem. And so he sends for Bathsheba's husband because she was not single. He was out fighting a war and brings him back to Jerusalem. And he thinks, well, she's back. He will go and be with his wife for a while. And then they will think it's their child. But her husband was too noble a man to do that. He refused to go see his wife while his comrades were out fighting a war. And so he stayed in the, t in, in, in the palace, in the basement, and waited until he was sent back. And so David had him killed. Not a very good story. David fails on many points of that. And then Nathan comes to him. And Nathan set, tells him a story. He says there is a, a rancher who has many, many animals. And he has the, the, the pick of the best animals in the kingdom. And there's another man who is poor and he only has one little lamb. And one day this, this man, this rich man, who had many animals, was out walking around and he ran into this poor man with this one little lamb. And he decided that he wanted that lamb for his own. And so he took that lamb from this poor man and added it to his flock. And he's telling this story to David and David's just getting more and more angry as he hears the story being told. And finally, he, just, he, he goes, this man has to pay. There has to be justice. Bring him to me. And Nathan looks at the king and says, oh, David, the rich man, that's you. You're the one. And immediately David understood what Nathan was telling him. And his response is this. He says, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But, because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. And David put on ash ashes on his head, and he wore mourning clothes, rough fabric, and he started to pray and to mourn over his own sin and this child that was going to be taken away from him. 
but the child died. And God made it clear that this, his sin had been taken away, but not the consequences of his actions. Oh, if that was only what happened, but actually the story continues. Later on in David's life, David and his son Absalom has a disagreement. And Absalom rebels against David. And finally, David has to leave Jerusalem. And so he's going out with his, his family, his, his wives, um, his, his staff, and they all leave Jerusalem to go into hiding because Absalom has taken over the city. And David leaves 10 concubines back in the palace to take care of the palace, hoping that because they are concubines, they'll be okay. And David leaves. And Absalom comes and he gets some advice from somebody that what he should do is take these concubines up on the roof. You know where David saw Bathsheba? Take these concubines up on the roof in front of all of Jerusalem and sleep with them. And that would be a way of showing Jerusalem that Absalom was king. And the Bible is quite clear that this too was the consequence of David's sin. Our sin brings tragedy. Always has. Always will. I don't know about you, but I can think in my life of the sins that tragedy has brought to me. I know I'm forgiven. But sometimes we live with the consequences of what we have done before. And like I said, this is something I wish we could learn when we are young. So we can avoid the consequences that we will have to pay for the rest of our lives. But sometimes it's hard, and sometimes it's harder for some of us than it is for others. But we live with consequences. Let's continue on. So the Lord said to, this, to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. That next blank is the curse. The first one to get cursed in the garden was not Adam and it was not Eve. It was a serpent. There. Give you a nice picture. The snake in the grass that tempted them to sin in the first place. Snakes and serpents in our culture have a kind of varied image. For some, there is actually a positive. A, a picture of a snake eating its own tail has been the uh, symbol of infinity for a, for a long time. No beginning and no end. The Hopi, Hopi, Hopi culture in, in the southern United States, native culture, uh, First Nations, they have a fertility rite which is based on snakes. And they dance and they celebrate with snakes. But other cultures aren't quite so positive. And the Bible always uses the serpent in a negative, in a negative form. It is often the way that we see Satan. He's a snake in the grass, always trying to get us to do something. So the tragedy has happened, and God comes and he curses Satan. He defeats Satan in Genesis chapter 3. 
He takes away some of his power. He makes him crawl along the grass or along the dirt, eating dirt as it says in the Bible. And he does this in Genesis chapter 3. And we sometimes forget that Satan is cursed. And we struggle with what that means for us. And too often we do listen to the dictates of the one who's trying to tempt us. We hear his words very clearly. Sometimes it's in our relationships. And we do wrong in our relationships. Sometimes it's over other things. Is anybody really going to know if I do this? So you've, heard, you, you've heard the serpent talking to you. Am I really, really going to pay any consequences if I do this? You've heard the serpent. Everybody else is doing it. Why can't I? You've heard the serpent. Satan wants to get us to do things that are not proper for us. Wants us to make decisions that takes God down a peg. Sometimes we are foolish enough to listen. Sometimes we recognize what Satan is doing and we stand up against him. But the temptation is there. There's a passage in Mark which we don't know how to handle. It's, it's right at the end of Mark. And some scholars are not sure it's really part of Mark. They, they think it might have been added a little later. And I don't usually talk about stuff like that. But if you look in your Bibles, you'll often see the end of, of Mark written in, in italics, because we're just not sure what to do with it. Um, I don't preach from the end of Mark very often. But there's a problem with it. Some of the most, of the earliest manuscripts don't have this ending that we have in, in our Bible. Some of them, which are written later, um, do. And so we, we struggle and we argue over what to do. The problem with it is that if we remove it, which nobody's proposing that we would ever do that, but if we did, Mark would be without a resurrection appearance, which makes no sense to anybody. But if we leave it in, it's got some stuff that we just don't quite understand. Let me read it to you. I'm not going to read you the whole, the whole part, but I'll just re read you this portion of it. He said to them, this is Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and they will drink deadly poison, and it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick, and the people they will, on sick people, and they will get well. Some of that's okay. But it's that part about picking up snakes and drinking poison that has gotten some people wondering, what are you saying? And there are churches that are built around this, where they, you, you come in and uh, get bitten by a snake, and if you live, then you can be part of the church. And if you don't, well, yes, you're not really a Christian. But I, we are not going to do that, ever. Just wanted you to know. Um, <laughs> there is, but. Um, the comment was there are different forms of, of bitten, right? Venom. venom. There are different forms of venom. There are. But. 
in ancient times, the reason why we have a universal fear of snakes, we really do, unless you've really de desensitized yourself by handling a lot of snakes, we have a natural fear of snakes. And the reason for that fear is that in ancient times, being bitten by a snake, any snake, really, was possibly to die. Can I put it that way? Because there was no anti-venom. There was no medicines you could take to get rid of it. And that's why we, why we fear snakes. I have a friend uh, who is who's deathly afraid of snakes. I mean, he absolutely hates snakes. I said to him one day that, that I wanted to go to Australia, you know, sometime. I'd like to go to Australia. And his immediate response was, do you know how many of the deadliest snakes in the world live in Australia? <laughs> like, you're nuts. Why would anybody go to Australia? That's where deadly snakes live. Um, it was so, you know, he was so afraid of snakes, I mean, even plastic snakes, that several years ago, uh, I took my family to South Dakota, and we went to the Wall Drugstore. And um, I remember the Wall Drugstore when I was young, and it wasn't quite, it was really just a tourist trap now, but back then it was kind of cool. You saw, you know, old cowboys and their stories in there. But we went to the Wall Drugstore, and I picked up a wooden snake <laughs> that slithered through your hands. It was because of the way it was cut. And I thought, this is just perfect for my friend. <laughs> I'm going to take this out when he's over at the house, and I'm going to show him. And I knew he'd go through, and he did. I, he came over, and he went through the roof, and I showed him my wooden snake. But the reason why is because snakes meant death in the ancient world. They didn't have what we have now to help us out. We've got anti-venoms that will help. And sometimes snakes meant slow death, slow death. But there was still death, so we were scared. To pick up a snake in Mark's time would have been a terrifying experience. And if you get bit, there wasn't much anybody could do to help you. Either you survived or you didn't. So as Christians, we, we read this portion of Mark and we're going, well, I don't know what to do with this. And as I was going through this week, going through Genesis 3, I'm going, is it possible? And I don't know that this is just coming off the top of my head. But is it possible that this is what Mark was talking about? It wasn't, he wasn't talking about snakes, but he was talking about the serpent of, three, of Genesis 3. In my name, you will be able to cast out demons. In my name, you will be able to handle the temptations of Satan. You will be able to do things that other people are, cause them to fall. I don't know that's true, but I think it's maybe a good lesson to learn from this passage in Mark. We don't have to be afraid of Satan. He's defeated. He was defeated in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning of the story. And we need to remember that and be able to be in the book enough that we know how to repel what Satan wants us to do. Well, we will go on. I will put en enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush, he, he will crush your head, and you will strike his head. Heal. And that long blank that comes next, the image of Christ in Genesis 3. The son who breaks and is broken. The son, Genesis 3 says that this person will be a child of Eve. A descendant of Adam and Eve. He will be a son. But he will both break 
and be broken. He will both come up against the power of Satan as well as be broken by that clash. From Genesis 3, we already have a story of the one who would come who would be a child of mankind, who would come and defeat the plans of the devil. He would cast demons out. He would put them into pigs and drive them over, over cliffs. He would do all of these things because his power is above that of Satan. And yet, at the same time, he would be broken. Which is what happened when he died on a cross. Already, Genesis 3, we already have the good news, which is what gospel means. That Jesus will come and he will be the answer that we need. And it was there from the very beginning. And fiction has picked up on this over the years. A lot of our fiction has. Um, start off with, with one that I like. I fell in love with uh, the writing of Frank Herbert when I was a young teen. Somehow I came into contact with his uh, book, Dune, and I read it. And I was enthralled by it. And I've read Dune countless times since. It's a huge book, but I enjoy it every time I read it. Dune is a story of a family who comes to a desert planet called Arrakis. And they come as off-worlders, but there is a prophecy on Arrakis that one would come from outside who would be the savior. And according to the book of Dune, that savior, savior is the young man who is a son of the people who come to the planet. And his name is Paul. And he knows how to do things that he shouldn't know how to do on this desert planet. And he is the Messiah of Dune. The problem with the story of Dune is that actually Paul, Paul becomes evil in the later books. But in the first book, he's good. But there's a direct allusion to what we read in the Bible of a Messiah that will come. And it's in our fiction. Maybe one that's better known to you is this one. Within the Star Wars, or sorry, yeah, Star Wars, um, saga, we have what we call the Skywalker saga, which follows the line of Skywalker down through the ages. And again, the Skywalkers were prophesied to be Messiah. Anakin was supposed to be, but he went to the dark side and became Darth Vader. So then all the hopes went to Luke. And there's actually a story that Mark Hamill suggested to the writers that he go to the dark side too, fight with his father for a while before he becomes good in the final scene. But they rejected that. And probably the saga is stronger because of it. But again, it is a, a, the idea of a Messiah who is going to come and deliver us from our problems. And in Genesis 3, we have the real story. And in Genesis 3, the very beginning, we already see the path that the Messiah is going to walk. Proto-Evangelion. These verses are often referred to as the Proto-Evangelion, and what that means is the first gospel. It is the gospel story laid out in Genesis 3. There will be a tragedy. We will need to be saved by somebody. We need a Messiah. Not one that can lead us politically, but one who can deliver us from our sins. We need someone to come because we keep on failing at it. And in Genesis, we have this story of the Messiah who will come, who will be a child of Adam and Eve, 
through Mary, who will grow up and break the power of Satan as well as be broken so that he can save us from our sins. We sang a song earlier, and I just want to pick up on some of the lyrics. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. The Bible has been speaking the name of Jesus from the very beginning. And it continues. And during this series, we're going to take a look at some of the other places where the Old Testament speaks the name of Jesus. The chorus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. We're going to celebrate communion. In just a minute, we're going to ask you if you would come and take the elements from those who will be up here serving them to you. But let me read a passage from Matthew. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. We speak the name of Jesus, the Messiah who has come to deliver us from the sins that we, that we have done. We don't worry about sins that somebody else did. It's just us. But Jesus died for your sins. He died for you. And in this simple ritual which Jesus told us to do, we come and eat and drink from his sacrifice. We're going to sing. Come, take your elements. Concentrate on what God has done for you. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you were broken, that you came in power, but that you were broken for us because of us so that we could deal with our sin. Now we just ask that you would inhabit this time together as we take of, the, of these elements that you shared with your disciples around that table so long ago. We give you the praise of our heart and we ask this, this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is power
taken your elements, that's no problem, but if you haven't, the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, and remember. The blood of the new covenant. Take, drink, and remember. And Father, we often don't understand your sacrifice, but we are grateful for it. We thank you, and we give all of our praise to you. Amen. Where did God place, put Adam and Eve? Yes. Garden of Eden, good. Second question was, oh, who did, yeah, who did God curse first? Yes? This, right. Good. One more. The hard one. What does proto-evangelion mean? You got it. So come see me. Not, not that you don't usually, but... I'll give you something. Okay. 
So as we start off the new year, I would really like just to pray with you all. I would like us to actually do the Lord's Prayer with each other. If you're able to, I really would encourage you to stand as we say this prayer together. And as we start off this year, and as we speak Jesus into our life and the lives of those close to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. If you do have tithes and offerings, you can send an e-transfer, BPCC treasurer at outlook.com. There is boxes here, but please join us as we close with one more song. How I long to bring the heaven Where pain is gone And mercy fills the stream To look upon the one who bled to say Walk with him for all
obey the path that Christ walks to bring justice upon the earth, to bring light to those who sit in darkness, to bring out those who live in bondage, to bring new things to all creation. May this path run through our life and may we be the road that Christ takes. Thank you for sharing some of your Sunday with us. We hope you come back again next week. 11 o'clock right here at Vantage Point and of course on Facebook. Grace and peace be with you. Have a wonderful week.